guys. So welcome everybody to Producing 101 Online. Oh, we're so glad you're here. We're fortunate to be spending the next hour with you, including your questions to get you started on the path or continuing on the path or, you know, just as you're going along the way to be a producer. So thank you for joining us and giving Sue a reason to put on lip gloss. And giving Larry a reason to do his hair. Well, I needed some reason for it. I mean, come on. All right, so some <laughs> housekeeping before we start, before we officially, officially begin. So uh, just take note, everybody. Um, it's always good for producers to set ground rules. So um, a lot of you guys have already probably had an experience with Zoom, I would imagine, over the, over the last few weeks. <laughs> um, but some of you may not have. So um, it's, it's pretty easy. Here we are. We're, you know, this is a little bit different because it's not a typical meeting. This is an actual webinar. So we can't see you. However, there is a, a Q&A and you can type your questions in because we're going to be taking those and we're going to be answering them live as we go tonight. And you put them, put your questions in the chat. Yeah. That's so right. we might be mentioning we might bring up some industry phrases here so just type in the comments if there's a specific subject underneath the producing umbrella that you want to learn more about we're happy to do more producing 101s we can do 201s 301s heck if this corona thing keeps up we can take you to proof uh, to producing graduate school let's go to grad school <laughs> <laughs> introductions okay allow me to introduce you to my producing partner sue gillard so she's a pretty impressive human being, I have to say. And she has excellent taste in making smart partnerships. Yes. Uh, you'll notice her producing credits are exactly the same as mine <laughs> since, ever since I met her. I mean, I couldn't quite shake her. So you'll notice some of her credits are, her Broadway credits are Moulin Rouge. Uh, Moulin Rouge, you guys may notice the Moulin Rouge on my shirt. Right, we are always marketing. Uh, Jagged Little Pill. Ah. Opening night. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, the current revival of company and uh, the Tony Award winning Angels in America and more. And lots more after Broadway's very brief current intermission. Okay, so what are we gonna cover tonight? First, what is a producer? We're gonna clarify that for you. We'll talk about what a producer does and doesn't do. Where do you find a project, source a project, create a project? How do you identify your team? The resources to build your cheerleaders and your community and actions to take during our industry-wide interval. So Larry already pointed out our swag. 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 <laughs> because like good producers, we cannot stop talking about our shows. Which brings us to our first point. How do you get to be a producer? Do you go to producer school like med school or law school that my mom only wishes I did? Larry, what do you do to be a producer? <laughs> nope, 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 nope. None of that, none of that school stuff. Um, you get to declare your new moniker as a producer. So if you're new and you're a bit shy, you can just begin by describing yourself as a, a budding producer. And, and what's the one thing that a producer needs? Hmm? A project. That's it. Once you're attached to a project, Congratulations, you're a producer. <laughs> so how do you find a project? Well, well, there's a lot of ways that that can happen, of course. So first and probably most common, uh, you see like an amazing show. You may see it in a basement in Greenpoint or reading of it around a kitchen table, or your friends may have written it, possibly in college. And <laughs> you think you think the show should have, you know, a broader audience, a bigger life. So you look around your world and no one is picking up the project, but why? It's so good, it's so good that I can't stop talking about it. That's when you know I have to produce the show. So think for a moment on the kind of theater that you absolutely love. Is it the big frothy musicals? Is it small two-person dramas? Something in between? And then think about the kinds of theaters that you frequent. Is it edgy? Is it downtown? Is it always a Broadway house or the big houses in the town that you live in? And then consider the shows you went to when you could still go to theater. That will give you the parameters to work within. So for your favorite plays and your favorite musicals, follow the playwrights, the composers, the lyricists, the people behind the team that made it all happen. So I think that right now we are unquestionably in the best time since the invention of social media 
to potentially get a response and build a relationship when you reach out to someone who you're a genuine fan of. And, and you'll hear a lot about it, about building relationships from us, because that is key to getting your favorite shows up and running with you as the lead producer. So what does a producer do anyway, Lauren? Very good question, Suzanne. So the way we like to explain it to muggles, the people not in the theater, it's like this. You know what a director does, right? So the director gets the show up and running seamlessly. We do the exact same thing for every element of the show, except for what happens on stage. And sometimes for what happens on stage too. <laughs> so as a producer, you're gonna shape the show's entire journey to get the biggest and most excited and most aligned audience possible. So for example, when we were producing the other Josh Cohen last year off Broadway, we were lucky in that, well, that it was- Hold that thought, hold that thought, Sue, hang on. This is not that kind of webinar, Lawrence. Oh, yeah, just oh in. stand up, stand up. I can only see four of your letters. Hold Hang on, because it's, it sparkles, it actually. Oh, Very that's good. gorgy. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, visual aids. So <laughs> with the other Josh Cohen, we were lucky in that it was already a stellar piece of theater and it was ready for a commercial off-roadway run. And then it was our job to get the best team to support the mission of getting the largest audience possible. So along with our writers, we got to amass the whole team. It's like being a casting director for everyone except the cast. So the general managers, the best actual theater location, the director, the designers, the, the um, press, social, lights, sound, everybody. And then it was time for us to reach out to our cheerleaders. So think about the people who love you, who believe in you, who are fans of the same things that you're passionate about to see what you can do about gathering a team. So the beautiful thing about theater is that it has to be done together. And think how much everyone will want this once we are all out of quarantine. I wanna hug all of you right now, <laughs> but I can't. So the other <laughs> job's coming. So we knew, we knew what theater we wanted, but it was occupied. There was a tenant there already, the show running. So, Rather than waiting, which by the way, Sue and I are really not good at, we decided to get going on a studio Thank album. You. Yeah, so I'm giving away all your secrets now. <laughs> we, we decided to get going on the studio album that you know, our writers, they had been wanting to do an album for years. So uh, lucky for us, our writers had been Broadway performers for decades and they had terrific friends. So they called Sutton Foster, Kelly O'Hara, Hank Azaria, Casey Levy, um, Lindsay Mendez, uh, Richard Kind, Celia Keenan Bolger, Brian Darcy James, James Roday, Jen Colella, um, John Ellison Conley, James Monroe Iglehart, and Cheetah Rivera. And Cheetah Rivera. Is now a good time for us to give away a CD, Lars? Let's be good producers and teach by doing how to create buzz by giving away stuff. But, uh, okay, so usually those things shouldn't cost you as a producer, so perhaps instead we can give away a free download of the album. Okay, best question asked by tonight's attendees. We'll get free album download plus, like, major kudos from us. Ooh, ooh, yeah, yeah. Oh, so we already have some questions coming in. Yay. Um, keep those questions coming, you guys, because we're going to get to all of those. Um, and really think about it as you're, as you're putting your questions in. They should be, obviously be personal to you, but something you feel like the whole group is going to get value from as a, an overall conversation. I know we're having a very basic producing talk tonight, but this will lead to the other ones and it's eventually to the grad school producing webinars. Um, so, okay, where do you find great theater? Okay, so you start by looking at the theaters and the kind of shows you spend the most time and energy on, okay? You can pick up a property, or if you have an idea for a show that doesn't even exist yet, you can commission it from an artist. Uh, and now it's yours, so what do you do next? Well, we like to identify cheerleaders for the show. And this is actually one of my favorite parts because in life, I'm identifying cheerleaders. So I want you guys to all think about this. Cheerleaders are someone that when you think about them, they make you smile, okay? So you have some of those people in your life. They're people that are gonna lift you up when it's really tough. That's your team. That's the people you wanna surround yourself with. So when you start 
getting your project going and moving into the place you want it to move to, to eventually to you know, big time, whatever that is, you have your crew that you've amassed along the way, your cheerleaders. So find shows that sit in the same wheelhouse as yours, okay? And you know, examine the paths that they took to get to a wide distribution. So that every show is gonna have a different journey. I mean, let's face it, there's no, no two shows are alike, but it's easier to follow a path that already exists. And meet everyone, I would say. This is, this is especially easy to do right now during our world intermission. Everybody's online. If there's, if there's somebody that you admire, go DM them on social. I mean, perhaps you can build a relationship with them and maybe even work on a project together. I think we're talking to you here, Benj and Justin. <laughs> In any case, everyone loves to hear when they have admirers. So begin to build your tribe by following theater folk that you respect. And, and there are a lot of Broadway themed groups on social media that you can find your tribe there. And this is definitely not a downtime for building relationships. It's the opposite. Um, no one can have the excuse that they're on a film set or they're in 10 out of 12s or they're on a honeymoon. It's the perfect time to reach out now and build your team to determine together how you can get to work and um, how you can get to know people. Just make sure that when you do that, you're wearing um, pants. <laughs> I haven't worn pants in weeks. I mean, frankly. <laughs> and then, you know, and then you can eventually get your show to Broadway or beyond, right? Well, you know, it's funny. A lot of people, they, they think Broadway is the ultimate goal of a show. And let's face it, I mean, Broadway is an amazing brand. It's, everybody dreams of making it to Broadway. We all did when we were kids. You know, it's, that's the thing, Broadway. Broadway is the stamp of approval you get so you can take your show to major visibility and profits, right? So we're talking like national tours, international tours, the big L, licensing, and the big S, subsidiary rights. Oh, and don't forget, Off-Broadway can give you that stamp as well. And okay, we, hang on, I'm, I'm getting my Off-Broadway swag. Exactly. How are we doing? Wait. Right? Okay. <laughs> that's Cohen, yeah, that's a, great, that's a great example of a show that didn't necessarily need to go to Broadway, but it got such a great buzz Off-Broadway that now it's licensed around the country and beyond. It's pretty exciting. So, so think about it, guys. Let's, let's think about taking some actions. So there's some actions that you can take now. So you may want to start doing this. You want to make your list. Now, Sue and I like to call it our chicken. Chicken list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, meaning, wait, but Sue, so you know this. So it's meaning the people that you've been too chicken to reach out to before. And trust me, there are a lot of them. So, so we're happy to help push you right out of your comfort zone and into success, quite frankly, because that's where the good stuff is. And then, and then partnership. I think you can figure out all the stuff that you stink at. And for me, that is like a pretty extensive list. And then begin to identify the people who are really good, not even just good at, but love that stuff. And uh, Larry's good at everything, which is why we work well together. <laughs> okay, so That's listen, I, like, I don't know. Sure. Lars, we have an agenda, but there are like a million questions. Yeah, yeah. Hang on, can I, can I get a good, okay, I have, Oh, this is totally me. I have no theatrical experience. I can't sing, but I want to get involved. <laughs> yeah, girl, boy. I don't know. You and me both, Jame. Um, what do I do to get started? Oh, boy. Okay. So, okay. So, you can't sing. Um, maybe can you act or dance? Or, but if you can't act or dance either, then you definitely, you're not going to be on stage. So, it's face it. That's just not, in, not, not in the cards. It's not going to happen. But there are so many opportunities in the theater that run the gamut. So, you may want to think about, if you're, if, I was going to say if you're young, but not even, about, it's not about being young. It's, it's at, at any age, you could take an internship. An internship is a great way to learn boots on the ground, exactly what it takes. You can intern with, you know, a general manager or a producing office or the theater company. There's a lot of different options and different ways to do that. And, and even right now, um, you know, there's this sort of, like Sue said, this intermission, there's internships happening right now because everybody's ramping up to when theater opens again and when we're back out hugging each other and, and back out on the stage. Okay, these are all awesome questions, but I need to share with you all a comment that says, well, it's a question, when does Larry do the next reveal? Oh. So good, <laughs> again, not that kind of show. I've there are a lot, a lot of really good questions, but one of them is, uh, it's sort of similar. Graduating college senior here, 
Congratulations, Grad. Best yeah. advice to break into the theater job market. Oh, yeah. Can I take this one? Is that yeah. okay? Totally. Okay, so, so um, Emily, I would start with the shows that you love. I would see who was the GM, the general manager of that show. Okay, you guys, let me, let me share with you a really good resource that Larry and I love and use all the time. It's IBDB, the Internet Broadway Database. A lot of people know IMDB, right? Internet Movie Database, same thing, except for Broadway. And on IBDB, they just zhuzhed up the site. It's quite lovely. You can actually find the opening night company of every pretty much everyone who was involved. So if you, uh, Emily, that's your question. Emily, if you are interested in press, doing PR, find out who the press was for your favorite 10 shows and reach out and say, listen, um, Moulin Rouge is one of my favorite shows and I love the press you've done. Are you accepting interns or can I send you my resume, right? Same thing if it's social or if it's an advertising, a general manager, um, a producing office, reach out. Of course, because it's theater, um, anybody you know, who knows somebody who knows somebody, put out there to the general universe, particularly people your parents' age, hey, listen, Broadway's my jam. It just makes me happy. I want to work in that field. Do you happen to know anyone in the industry that I could maybe have a phone or a Zoom conversation with to see if um, they can help me out accessing my dreams, right? So, Larry, you want to talk about how we broke in, how we're still trying to break in to the producing industry give El emily some ideas well did we mention this already so sue and i i talked about how we met can i talk about that to these guys sure keep your clothes on they may find it sort of interesting so sue and i met a gajillion years ago i don't know 23 years ago something yeah. like that it was the 90s. well it was the 90s 1996 <laughs> um to be exact so anyway sue was doing this very terrible i should i say that um off-broadway show uh <laughs> I was terrible in it. I don't, the show was good. Okay. No, everybody in it was very good, actually. Sue's a great hoofer, people. Just so you know, if, in case you're looking for somebody for your next, you know, 42nd Street, here's your girl. Um, so <laughs> produce it, though, instead. Yeah. So anyway, so we met way back then when she was doing this off-Broadway show, and we kind of hit it off like mad, like crazy, and we kept in touch over the years, and we sort of lost touch. And then we reunited... <sighs> I don't know, 12, 13 years ago. And we just started to build businesses together. It was our thing. We have internet businesses. And then we both really want to be back in the theater. It was such a passion of ours. And um, so we knew we always wanted to produce as well. We didn't really know how that worked or how it happened. But um, we started getting a very quick education and we dove right in. And our first thing that we, like major production was a show called Disaster that was um, off Broadway, <laughs> and then it moved to Broadway back in, what year was that, 2000 and- Hamilton year. 16, 16? Well, off Broadway, 2015. So anyway, that's really how we, we started together, was with that show, and we just went from there, and we started producing other shows, and we love the whole bit of it, the whole um, teamwork, and we love raising money and all that stuff. That will be another topic for another webinar, by the way. Um, how to raise funds for a show, because I know that's, that, that's actually, you know what, Larry, there are a lot of questions on fundraising. So maybe we can just sort of cover it here because people want to yeah. know, here's one question. How do I get a seat at the table? Here's another question. Do I need to invest my own money? So do we want to talk about how you get a seat at the table at a Broadway show? Yeah, sure. So you got to be out meeting people. And well, like you were saying, Sue, before about right now is an incredible time to meet people, even though I know we're all in, but social media has you know, freed us from the confines of having to, having to be out all the time. So, and there's tons of readings that are happening now online and you can get access to things, right? So it's about getting out and meeting people or getting, being in and meeting people, right? And that will lead to, you have to let people know what you're up to, of course, and that will lead to conversations about being a co-producer Right? You may, some people will start, if they have the means, as an investor. It could even be a very small investment, right? And that could end up leading to becoming a co-producer on a show, and that will get you a seat at the table. And that's how you learn everything, by doing. So for us, the last show that Larry and I invested in that was not a show of our own was this little, tiny, beautiful show at Second Stage called Dear Evan Hansen. And you remember this, Larry? I was sitting... It, I was a wreck after I saw Dear Van Hansen, and all I thought was, I really want my teenage daughters, who weren't yet really old enough to see it, I want them to have a chance to see this show. 
And maybe if I help on some level, a little level, to bring it to Broadway, by the time it gets there, my kids will be old enough to see this show and really res um, resonate with its message. But, <laughs> but we talked about, did, did we want to potentially be co-producers on the show? And we said, well, how, how are we going to pitch this to our investors? We, you know, the kid kills himself in scene two, and there's nobody incredibly we famous. We were young producers, young producers, and we were just kind of getting started, really. So talking about pitching a show like right. that to our new, very new investor base. Yeah, so we thought there's no way they're going to think we're crazy. They don't, we, don't, we don't have their credibility. Like, we don't have their respect or their trust that we can pick them. And then, of course, you know what happened. Of course, all of our investors got mad at us for not coming to the Dear Evan Hansen table. So, okay, so that was a thing. But apropos being in the room where it happens, right? So meaning... Here, let me read this one. How do you get invited to producer meetings and readings? Likewise, how do you choose people you'd like to come to your reading? Oh, well, we love doing this. So let me, let me just address first being in the room where it happens and getting to the room where it happens. Anytime anybody invites you to anything, no matter how bad you think it's going to be, in the beginning, go. go. When Larry and I, when we walk into a room together, when we walk into a party together, when we walk into a social together, when we walk into an actress fund event together, the, the first thing we say to each other when we walk in the room is, by and then we each go our separate ways and we make friends with people in the room who we think will share our interests if we're going to a reading all right here's some tips you guys you're never allowed to sit on the end seat at a reading you have to go and sit in a seat that has people on either side of it and you don't know them and then you have no choice except to take a breath and do that one uncomfortable moment of like hi i'm sue how did you end up here today and it's not weird because they're in the same room the more people you know, as you go to more and more readings, the more likely it is that you will be invited to their readings. And over time, you get a sense of who actually could move the dial with you. People who are serious about either investing on their own, raising money, being co-producers or bundlers, and or being part of the creative process. So one of the things that Larry and I do is we're executive producers on projects, which means we are producers for hire. An executive producer does everything needed except raise the funds. And, and frankly, for years, we were just known as fundraisers. That was the thing we did to get a seat at the table. And slowly over time, as you build your expertise, you can be known as someone who really fosters the creative elements, chooses where does the show go? Where does it go out of time? What do we need in terms of dramaturgs, maybe? What do we need in terms of development, cutting, snipping? Who needs to be playing which roles? So now as executive producers, we're always kind of asking ourselves, wait, are, are, are they sure they don't want us to fundraise? Because we thought that that was our wheelhouse for a long time. But then we got our hands dirty in the business. And now what we love, I don't know what we love best. I mean, Larry and I, we love to fundraise for the shows we believe in, but we really, really get um, a lot of happiness out of the creative process, and we cast our friends, and you should too. <laughs> well, I, you, you should cast our friends. Actually. <laughs> Everybody should cast our friends. Well, it's interesting because there's a delicate balance there with you know that being a creative producer because you also want to be the producer that casts really well. And what I what I'm saying by casts it well, I'm not talking about the actual cast. I'm talking about hiring the casting director and hiring the director and the general manager and the advertising agency and the social media, everybody that you're using, the marketing people. If you do that really well and you're creative there and you know how to do that, your job is so much easier. And you do get to be a great creative producer, but it comes, it's, it's fluid because everybody's in the same conversation. It's like a beautiful dance. And that's always what you hope for with any show. You know, there's, there's going to be some bumps in the road. It's never perfect. But um, certainly, you know, that's like, going back to what I said earlier about having the cheerleaders, man. That's your team. That's your crew. And I will say, I'm pointing over at Sue, if, you, if you're lucky enough to find a partner in all this madness, I highly recommend it. And I think everybody can do that. You know, and that might not happen right away. It could take a little while to happen, but it could happen, like Sue was talking about, being a reading, you know, you're sitting alone, you turn around and you say hello to somebody, you never know what that relationship can turn into, right? The, the, the world is an oyster at that point. And everybody likes to connect. And boy, we're we going to want to connect more than ever when we're all released from, from quarantine. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of questions about being pitched projects. Here's one in particular. Hi, Sue and Larry. Hi. My question is, how do you feel about being pitched project by artists? Thank you for this. 
great webinar. Oh, that's so nice, Ben. Ben Franklin. Oh my gosh. Um, how do you, so how, here's how we feel. Here's how we feel about being pitched projects by artists. If you don't pitch your project, we are never going to produce your project. But you have nothing to lose by pitching. In fact, it's it's our job as producers to figure out which ones we're going to catch. Right. So we as producers, the best way that we like to be pitched is through someone who we trust in the industry who says you've got to look at this project. The way that the other Josh Cohen came to us was 20 some odd years ago, I did super fun summer stock with this incredibly talented actor named Steve Rosen. I told him I'm gonna be the president of your fan club for the rest of my life. He went on to Broadway this, Broadway that, Guys and Dolls, Spam a lot, you know it. I mean, everything. And then uh, had this show that he'd written with his friend David Rossmer and, and Steve's like the funniest person I know other than Larry. So I was like, he said, can you produce my show? And, and I said, well, you know, we don't actually know how to do this yet. And he said, well, <clears throat> show's not ready for it yet. So figure it out in the next 18 months and more or less we did. So it, there's nothing better for me than producing shows of people that you love or that came from people that you love. Then Larry and I meet I know you want to talk. I'm not going to let you know. Um, then we meet a lot of people because we're always uh, out there in the world because we have to see, we're, when we're busy looking for a project, we're going to go to absolutely everything, everything. One of us or both of us will be there. But when we have a project, you're not going to see us around as much because we're working on it. Okay, now talk. Well, it's funny. Um, oh boy, what was I going to say? Was that the other Josh Cohen? Oh, oh, oh. I remember when Sue told me about the other Josh Cohen. She's like, listen, my friend Steve and all these things she just said about how much she loves him. He wrote this great show. I saw it in its infancy and I think it's really funny. And I was like, well, send it to me, let me hear it. Within five minutes, I called her back and I said, this is our show. Like sometimes you also, you just know. It's like, it's just like a sensibility. And you just know it and it was right. And boy, we, we wrote it out. We're still writing it out, which is really, really cool. Um, I want to take, there's another funny question on here. Well, a funny comment and then a question I'm going to take um, from Chaz. Sue, when I last saw you, you promised to find me a nice Jewish husband. <laughs> I'm still waiting. Yeah, Sue, I do that. Come on, Sue. Find, find I know, I'm a good casting director, you guys. It's true. Yeah. Um, okay. So this <laughs> is a question for both of us. What do you think differentiates a great jukebox musical, Jagged, Jagged. good taste, from the not good ones? You know which ones I'm talking about. Okay, Ooh. can I take it? Or you want to... I, I kind of do. I, I actually, I want to first talk about what I think differentiates a great musical or a great play or a great piece of art from another piece of art. So people will say, is this show up your alley? I'll tell you what shows are up my alley. Was I touched and moved and was I destroyed or made a better person at the end? You know, Larry was, you were the one who first saw Jagged Little Pill very, very early on. And Larry was, he was, came, uh, we, he came to lunch and he was all puffy eyed and, and he was a big mess and he was like, we have to, hang on, we have to. and so that's, <laughs> I was like, sure, Larry, done. Cause he was just, so, you know, it, it stays with you afterwards, right? I think about Dear Evan Hansen stayed with me after second stage for months. It was haunting. And Moulin Rouge, Moulin Rouge, you know, my kids of course are not very excited by or impressed by anything theater. So I took my 17 year old, it happened to be her birthday. Remember this Lars? On the final dress, final dress rehearsal for Moulin Rouge. And I said, okay, I'm not telling you what we're doing, but uh, save your birthday night for me. And as we got closer to the theater, she was like, we're not seeing a show, are we? And I was like, could you like, just have this much faith? Hated New Yorker. Just a, just a little bit. And we see, you know, we go in and there's a huge crazy pre-show at Moulin Rouge, swallowing swords and lots of dancing and people not wearing a lot of clothing and very fun interactions. And she's kind of, you know, um, by the end of Act One, she turns to me and she said, holy, and that was it. I had her. Um, that's, that's what I think makes a great show. There are great jukebox musicals, but it's not because it's a jukebox musical. It's because it's an incredible show. And, and Diablo Cody, our book writer for Jagged Little Pill, really wanted to create a story that resonated today and then augmented by this incredibly resonant and powerful album that came out in 95, but somehow seems even more prescient today. Yeah. Good. Okay, I'm done. Your turn. 
<laughs> no, you, you covered it. That's good. Um, so many good questions here. Oh, this is a good question for us. Um, if you cast your friends, how does a newer designer get to become friends with producers? So, okay. It was a little tongue in cheek when, you know, when Sue said we cast our friends. Absolutely, you know, we, <laughs> we, we have very talented friends and we want to use them and cast them. Okay. However, like Sue said earlier, we are always out meeting new people. Like we love to meet a young, hot designer, like somebody who is like really up and coming and, but we have to know about you. So you have to, you know, be able to present yourself, pitch yourself in a great positive way. That's not necessarily, I, I don't, I'm not pushy, but I, I always say press, but not push, like be present. You know, and um, that's how you'll get to know producers like us. Because we do, everybody, want, look, everybody wants to find the, the best new talent. Who doesn't, yeah. right? So um, if you're out there and you're a hot shot and you're, you got talent, man, please find the producers, get, get in conversation with them, get in those rooms. Um, you never know when you'll meet one on the subway. I got to tell you real quick, I was wearing, because I used to wear my Josh Cohen hat. I still wear it a lot, but I was wearing it literally every day. Um, while well, the show was running and I was on the subway and there was a woman all the way across the subway car from me and she points at my hat and it's so crowded. She points at my hat. I'm like, what is she pointing at? Oh, my hat. And I was like, she goes, I love that show. And I was like, oh, the other Josh Cohen. And we got off the train. This, we both got up at 42nd Street and we started talking. She was a college student and she ended up doing some marketing for us just because she, you know, she didn't know I was a producer of the show until we started talking. So it was cool. You know, you got to step out a little bit. That, by the way, is um, that's the kind of person that we're looking for when we want to work with anybody. Somebody who's going to say, I love and, and be able to communicate and be able to build relationships. Um, mm -hmm. I remember after Josh Cohen, after all 187 performances, almost all of them, Larry or I, or most of the time, both of us were there. And there's sort of like a, like a big welcoming lobby area that everyone comes out at. And we listen first to who's talking and what they're saying, because that's incredibly valuable as they're leaving. But then the people who are like, oh my gosh, I have my ex-boyfriend, my father, my dog, they all have to see the show. We would be sure to go over them and say, hi, I'm the producer. Thank you so much. I understand that the show really resonated with you. The next time that you come back, if you bring 10 friends, your ticket's on us. Because we needed to be boots on the ground, really making it happen for a show that didn't have the same budget as a Moulin Rouge or a Jagged Little Pill or an Angels in America. Mm. I want to read this one. This one's a good one, Larry, I think for probably a lot of people on this webinar. I have produced, oh, it's by anonymous attendee. I have produced in the past regional theater, but when I moved to New York City, I decided to focus on acting. Good. So if I'm an actor and want to continue to act, is it viewed as a conflict of interest to produce in New York City as well? Oh, I'm going to take this because I want to talk about Cagney with this one. Is that okay, Lars? Absolutely. Okay. So um, one of the first shows that I was involved with in New York was a beautiful show called Cagney. And my dear friend, Bobby Creighton, had created the show and he was the star, is the star of the show. And he's a magnificent person. He's the kind of guy that everybody wants to help. So we were bringing the show to the York Theater off Broadway on the east side. Who was so mysterious. <laughs> I know. And, and, uh, and Bobby had a lot of people who wanted to write checks just because they love him that much and believe in him and he's just an exceptional human. So uh, he said, should I also be a producer on this? And we agreed, absolutely, you should be a producer on this, but maybe you don't need to have your name above the title. So then it would literally be Robert Creighton Presents, Robert Creighton in Cagney, written by Robert Creighton. Because it was all those things were true. So we just left his name off as a producer and let him be what he deserves to be and is, which is a star. So it's definitely not a conflict of interest to be a producer, because frankly, who believes in your project more than you? If you're going to be an actor, um, you know who just told me, Lee, Seymour just told me the same story that he was uh, in an off a show that was moving to off Broadway, and in order to help get it to off Broadway, Triassic Park, he became a producer on the show, and poof, his producing career, though unexpected, began. Mm. All right, let's see. Um, oh, Marla wants my Moulin Rouge shirt. <laughs> hey, Marla. Everybody, how does it? This is sort of a broad question. So, Caroline, if you have more detail, we can answer it. But how does a Broadway show become successful, huh. and what does that look like? Uh, oh, okay. So that's the great X factor. All right, take it, Lars. It is the X factor. Like every show you produce, every show you go into, you think it is the best possible show 
to happen right now. Otherwise you wouldn't produce it, right? So you go in with the expectations of this show is gonna run as long as, longer than Phantom of the Opera. We're gonna be, we're gonna, Hamilton who? You know, like that's the show we're gonna be. Now, there's a lot of things that happen between that thought and then the actualization of the show and when it starts to run and the time that it happens. I mean, who would have thought guys that this, this was gonna happen now with this, you know, this uh, pandemic, right? That shows that were literally in development. Now, a lot of them have been scrapped. Some have just been put on hold. Um, some shows were, you know, in previews on Broadway and weren't able to open yet. So you never know what's gonna happen along the way. You just never know. So you have to go into every show, first of all, picking a project that you must do. And I'll tell you, Sue and I know that well, because we did dip our toe in with a project that we didn't fully believe in, but we thought, oh, this might be a good idea because it has things that look like it can make it, make it um, a success. And, but we didn't really, really believe in it. So that was one show that we couldn't move forward with. And we just knew that in our, in our, in our gut, right? And we learned a big lesson then, that any show that we choose, it has to, we have to feel it in our gut. Then the rest is a, a, somewhat out of your control, right? Because you want to do all the right things for your show. But timing has a lot to do with it. You know, audience response has a lot to do with it. The, the director that you, that you hired and you trust, maybe they went in a completely different direction, you know? And you weren't expecting that to happen. So anything can happen. So you want to touch more on that? I actually, I'm, I'm, I'm vetting as many as I can. So there are two related questions here, and I like them both, and I think we can answer them at the same time. Number one, what are some red flags to watch out for in projects? We have many. And number two, same, what is the biggest mistake you made on producing a show and what did you learn from it? Thank you, Sydney, for only saying the biggest mistake, for limiting it to just one. Let's talk about red flags first. Um, when the funding isn't there, when the belief isn't there, when you're getting different answers from different people, when you don't know who's steering the ship, when someone thinks they have more control than they do, when someone else thinks they have less control than they do, when you don't have clear directives coming down from management. Uh, what have I forgotten, Larry? I think you covered, the big one is clear directives from management or really clear from you know, the, the lead, whoever's the, the lead, lead producer of the, the project. Cause that, you know, it all trickles down really. You know, that's where it starts. You create, that's like, you know, Sue and I, what we, why we love and why we love to work together as a team is because our whole thing is creating an atmosphere of joy, love, fun, and collaboration and teamwork. And we make sure that that's there, but not all producers are gonna do that. And that's a big red flag if you don't have that, in our opinion. Yeah, for us, it's okay if no one shows up to our reading as long as the two of us are there, because then it's still gonna be a party. <laughs> It may have just been the two of us on this webinar and that could have been it, but luckily, no, we have like 60 people. You know, it's nice that you guys all joined us. It's awesome. Okay, this is a specific question. Might be too specific for this webinar, but I kind of like it. As a law student, I'm interested in what the first legal documents you compile are, good, and the initial steps you take to start formalizing the dream. Okay, I will say, this is probably one of the biggest pains in the neck for most new projects and producers because you got to get people to believe in something before it's an actualized thing. So by the time we were co-producers on Moulin Rouge and it was a while, I don't remember how long, it was a while even before we did our out of town in Boston that we jumped on as co-producers. By the time the show was in Boston and people were like, please, 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 can I invest? We were like, we have not one penny left available in this show. We are completely capped out. So on the other side of that is when you have nothing but a script and a dream and you tell your investors, okay guys, we need some front money in order to get our attorney to write an option agreement so that we can option the property and therefore have the right to produce it. All right, so there's some language in there. So first, front money, but you wanna say I something. One thing real quick, just on that point, because I think you guys might be all thinking this, because a lot of people think, oh, you have to be wealthy to be a producer, or you have to, it has to be all, you're, you have to put all your money into a show. That is not true. You need to be scrappy to be a producer. We are scrappy. We're scrappy, and yeah, hey, it's great if Look you have- at us. Exactly. Cool if you have your own money, you want to put, you know, that's fine. But I think cooler and even better and more important is that 
you can amass a team of people who all agree to put in some so that it's, it's a group, it's a crew. It's not just all on you. Yeah, you listen, it really helps. And we see a lot in the New York Broadway community, we see a lot of partnerships where one person is young and scrappy and the older person is perhaps more of a Czech writer. And those two partnerships are beautiful together because they can make magic happen. Larry, um, which one are you? Okay, listen, when, oh, this is such a nice question. What was one of your favorite memories from producing a show? Do we want to talk about opening night for Moolah. I mean, there are a lot. There, there are a lot. Um, favorite memory, closing night from Josh Cohen, maybe the party for Josh Cohen the that we celebrated. Josh, Wait, opening night of Josh Cohen, I think. Opening night of Josh Cohen was crazy, but also closing night was really great because we made a rule, us and the writers of Josh Cohen, we made a family pact that we would have a no assholes rule with Josh Cohen and closing night party, we had only no assholes at the party, which is in theater, it can be hard to do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay. it, was, it was so spectacular. I mean, it was really, really special. Wait, did we? <laughs> Sorry, did we talk about our biggest mistake we made on producing a show? Did we cover that? I don't know. We have so many biggest mistakes. I think, I, I think, um, so listen, when, when you find a project and however it is that you're involved in it, either you pick it up as a lead producer or you get hired to work on it as an executive producer, or you are um, one of the co produ however it is that you find a project, you you got to make a commitment to yourself to see that thing through to the bitter end, whether it is the next Hamilton or whether it is the next Enron, the musical, it's your baby from start to finish. And you have to treat it like it's a romantic relationship that you respect it, that you love it, that you have integrity around it. What I don't appreciate and, and it happens more in our industry than I would like is that the minute that you get a bad New York Times review or the minute that your Aunt Tilly saw it and said, I left an intermission, I didn't understand why you even produced that play, um, that anybody else would dare to insult my child. So I really like, I, I think the biggest mistake that people make around shows is giving up on it when you originally had the dream. Hmm. Um, now, the flip side of that is you have to know when a project is no longer viable or no longer viable for you. Right. And you know what, guys? You can't say yes to everything. You have to be really... We had, we had an interesting year, and it was the year of Josh Cohen. I know we're talking a lot about Josh Cohen here, but it was so seminal for us. Uh, right. It, there were okay. so... Carry on. <laughs> there, yeah. There were I don't so, even know what that says. What does that say? There were so many projects that were brought our way during that year where we were just really focused on the other Josh Cohen that we had to say no to and turn down. And they're projects we probably would not have said no to had we not been working so diligently, but we had to, and you need to know when to do that. So it's not, you know, you, you want to say yes as much as you can, meaning yes, like I'm going to go to that reading, I'm going to go to this reading, I'm going to show up, I'm going to, I'm going to go to this networking event, this theater networking event, all this kind of stuff. We got to talk about Broadway Cares, let's not forget. It's oh, oh, I do so. Well, that actually, because there's a lot of questions on here from like, I just graduated from college. I'm just about to graduate from college. How do I get a, how do I make money? Oh, girl, you got to hustle. Actually, I don't know if you're a girl or a boy, but you got to hustle. I mean, when we were mediocre actors, sorry, Lars, um, there was day job. There was night job. There was all, same thing if you're working in the industry, you know, you get an internship by day and then at night you do your waiting tables or in my case it was being a freelance proofreader or Larry Larry actually you should probably acknowledge your whole of the world Larry decided he was going to do something sensible as his survival job so he became a licensed massage therapist a holistic health coach he has a whole other career in the realm of uh wellness and working with health professionals but a funny us, story about that in a second go ahead yeah, okay, are you gonna take off more clothes? Because that no, would be good. Actually, let me just in interject it really quick. So this is a fun <laughs> okay. so it was opening night of disaster um, on Broadway, and I'm in a tuxedo. You know, it's our first Broadway show opening night. And it was so exciting. And um, I, I was there, I remember in the back of the theater, um, at the back of the orchestra, and a very famous, I won't say who it is, very famous Broadway actress came up to me because she used to be one of my massage clients. And she came up to me and she said, oh, are you the massage therapist for the show? And I looked at her, I go, no, I'm on the producing team. And she goes, 
Well, look at you. It was such a great moment. And nothing wrong with being the massage therapist for the show, mind you, at all. But um, it was just a really cool moment. Like, man, whatever it is you dream about, you can do. You just got to get out and go. So, you you know, it, and it's funny because it is about declaring. Because I see a lot of questions here. Like, here's one. How did you originally meet directors, GMs, marketing people to know who was good? And how do you develop this talent? Okay, I'll say two things about this. The, the first one is you, you have to make that declaration that Larry was talking about in the beginning of the webinar of like, I am a budding producer. Hey, universe, I know that you know me as a school teacher, an oncologist, uh, you know, an underwater basket weaver, but actually my passion has always been theater. And now I'm dipping a toe into the producing waters. Who do you know? Who knows someone? Who knows someone? So I can get started. Now, if you're not in the New York market yet, then you're golden because you have a regional, when we're not COVIDing, you have a big regional theater scene. And I would actually say, reach out to the artistic director and say, listen, I, can I in, intern for you? Can I pass out playbills on a Saturday night? What can I do that's useful? Can I come in and meet you and see how I can be an asset and um, a megaphone for what you guys are doing here and help you sell tickets in some way? You know, get, get boots on the ground, get feeling like that theater when you walk in, there's ownership there. You belong to it. Mm. And then the other way that we met directors and GMs and marketing people is for the other Josh Cohen, we hired GMs. We, we interviewed a lot of general managers and we were so frank with them. We said, listen, we're new kids in town. We don't know people in the industry. You guys, GMs, have been doing this for 20 years and everybody speaks so highly of you. Can you hold our hands? Can you take us through the paces instead of just doing the normal work that a GM does and being left alone by the producer? Can we sit in your office and can we choose our team together? And who, who did we, we got our lighting designer. I mean, oh, Jeff Croyd. We got our lighting designer for our GMs. Our GMs, we had no credibility, of course. So our GMs helped us to get the theater. Now it did help that we were able to raise the funds before we secured the theater, but it was the GMs association with us that really got us the West Side Theater. So I would say, Smart partnership with one person who's been doing this for a really long time will lead to even better partnerships with uh, everybody that you need for your core team. And Larry and I, we don't know everybody, but we're really clear on who we will work with in the future and who we won't. And I'll tell you guys, Sue, Sue is the ultimate Jewish mother, and I love having her around for that reason. I mean, not, not that you need more than one Jewish mother, but, but I have many. But Sue really is, and the reason I say this is because she always has the idea she goes above and beyond. And let me just give you an example of that. Um, the box office staff. A lot of people kind of overlook the box office staff at theaters. They are integral to our business and our industry. So Sue always thinks we should bring them treats. And that's like during tech and during previews, like bringing them treats, because most people just don't do that, you guys. So it's the little things that you could do like that along the way that really help building those great relationships. And um, they all love the sweets. There's a, there's, a really, there's a really good question in here about why do producers always talk about cast size? And oh. why is that? That's a great question. You want to take that one, Lars? Yeah. <laughs> you, you may often see, you know, if you see Sue or me at a, um, uh, a reading, you may see us like this. <laughs> That's true. Because if the cast is too big, they're like, eh, unproducible. It depends on the show, you know what I mean? But with, with the way the landscape is now and how Broadway and off-Broadway works, you have to have a certain size cast. If it's too big, it's not going to work. The budgeting won't work and it's not viable. You'll never, you'll never recoup your money, let alone become profitable. So, um, you know, for off-Broadway, you know, I'll use Josh Cohen as a great example again. Um, Josh Cohn was originally written, it was originally written, for, I think we're just for the two guys, originally, originally, right? And then it, it evolved. Um, and then it was a cast of six, right? Cast of six, right? And, but the cast was also the band. Very smart. Producers like that, right? Uh, but it has to work with the show. And fortunately for the show, it did. But then it got, um, it had a production before we produced it off Broadway um, in Rochester that had a cast of eight. And we realized though, doesn't need a cast of eight. That eighth person was actually too much, doesn't need it. So we were very happy. We actually, we wanted to bring it back down to six, but we also realized, hmm, we need seven. There were some, you know, technical reasons why we needed to be seven people, the, the ratio to men and women and instruments that were played and all that. 
but that was really important and that's what made the show work because if it had to be seven in the cast plus a band of three or four, it never would have been able to be viable as an off-Broadway show. So you have to look at that. I mean, look at, you know, even a show like Moulin Rouge, which is huge, multi-million dollar musical, and it's a very large cast, but nothing is wasted. It is within an inch of its life, every person that's used is used in a really smart way. And you need to make sure of that because you're gonna end up, if the show becomes successful and it goes on, you're gonna be hiring vacation swings and swings to cover sick leave. So you're hiring on more and more people. And of course, you can do that as you have a successful show because the funds are there. But you don't have it in the beginning necessarily. Uh, here's a fun question, Larry. I think we're gonna have some similar answers to this and some different. What would be your dream show to produce? Tommy, can you hear me? We love Tommy. Yeah. <laughs> For me, it's Tommy. Absolutely. I I saw that show on Broadway and it was, I was electrified. And then when I was doing a national tour of a non-union AFT show, um, we were in Toronto. I think we were in the Winter Garden Theater and they were downstairs in the Elgin and we, they let us see the show because we were doing children's theater at 10 a.m. and they were doing 8 p.m. performances. and I remember there was a scene where I, I, we were of course sitting in the like whatever leftover seats. And so I could see into the wing and in the wing, in wing one, the actors were lined up one after the other and they were about to get on stage and they were jogging together in place, in tandem, silently getting their energy up as a group to come racing out on stage. And I was hooked. I mean, that's a show. Okay, what's yours? Well, it's, that's definitely one of mine. I mean, Tommy, we can agree on that very easily. Um, but um, we kind of did it already, but, but there will be more. Angels in America was, that was for me, I saw it when I was in college. I was a junior in college. It kind of changed my whole everything, right? It was just that important. And then when we heard that it was gonna be revived 25 years later, I said, Sue, we have to be on this producing team. We didn't know though those people yet. We didn't know the ones that, the. Um, the, Should we tell everybody how we met Tim? I mean, that's probably a kind of a good. Is it, right. You're gonna tell you. Wait, so, so this ties into Broadway Cares, actually. So Larry and I are both very involved in Broadway's charity, Broadway Cares, Equity Fights AIDS. Um, it, Broadway Cares is doing miraculous things right now in supporting the Actors Fund and getting people uh, the support that they need. It, it's a crazy, crazy trying time. But when Broadway Cares, they do events like. Um, uh, the Red Bucket Follies and Easter Bonnet that you can get a ticket to to celebrate all the events. And one of them, one of their most fun events is the Fire Island Dance Festival, where dance festivals come, uh, dance groups come from all over the world, like Moscow, Cuba, Jersey, and they all do these beautiful performances on a private deck on Fire Island, and it's incredible. Okay, this is where the story picks up on you because it was your speedo i think that made this happen right someone someone's there was a speedo involved wasn't there there's it's fire island there's always speedos involved i don't know <laughs> um <laughs> you want me to take the story from here yeah because you met him <laughs> okay so there's like a, a mixer i guess it was after the the, the festival whatever it was it was you know a cocktail kind of thing or it was like outside fabulous wonderful and i start talking to this guy named timmy this really great british accent and we're just chatting what do you know it turns out to be tim levy who is um, lead producing Angels in America, the National Theater from London. And I nearly fell on the floor and I said, well, Tim, my producing partner and I, we, we want to be producers on that show. How can we make that happen? And he smiled and he laughed. He said, oh, it's cool. It's, you know, it's, we have really have everything together. I said, totally get it. Uh, and then we just kind of had a great time. And I said, you know what, can we, let's meet again in the city. He said, great, great, come by my office. So Sue and I went to his office in the city and then he kind of dangled a carrot over. He's like, well, I might have a spot. Let's see, let's see. A few days later, he called us. He had a spot for us. And I tell you this, you guys, because again, you never know who you're going to meet anywhere. So you want to present yourself in the best way that you can, be your best self at all times. But um, I think it was the conversation we had with him. Like he didn't know us yet. And you know, sitting down and talking with him and hearing our passion for the project, and you know, we were dying to work with Marion Elliott. Of course, now we're working with her again on this revival of company. But um, being able to be a part of Angels in America for me was such a dream come true. I just I love that show, and that revival was just stunning. 
and we won a Tony Award on top of it. Hey. So that that's a good example of the room where it happens. Get if you're on this webinar, then theater is your jam. So just get and where are the theater people hanging out? So for me, Broadway Cares was my way in. When I was at a Broadway Cares event, I knew that everybody in the room loved Broadway or they were probably married to somebody who loved Broadway. So it was an easy and a not weird jumping off point to start a conversation. Likewise, whenever I go to see a show, not even when I'm at readings, but when I'm at actual theater, I like to turn to the person next to me and say, hey, what brought you to this show? It's not weird. Because they're already, um, it's like you've already profiled them. They're already in the same space as you. Yeah. And same with when you're finding people online. We should mention some of the online resources that we really like and, and, uh, and use. By the way, before you do that, by the way, if you do say hi to someone that's next to the theater and they're not, they're like, mm, <laughs> not your people. Okay. Okay, great. That usually doesn't happen. But if it does, so what? Don't, don't let that stop you from doing it the next time is what I'm saying. Good, great. Now I forgot what I was going to say. Awesome. Oh, well, oh uh, resources. resources. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we love the Broadway briefing. There are two versions of the Broadway briefing. It's a daily email that comes in your email box Monday through Friday. And there's one that's a free version and one that's a paid version. Guess which one we're going to recommend? Free! It's terrific resources. It'll keep you on the vanguard of what's happening every single day. Then you want to, if you still um, use Facebook as Larry and I do like the mom genes of social media, <laughs> um, then you can follow the wing. You can follow all the shows that you love. Following the shows that you love will actually lead you to individual artists, other shows, cool offshoots that are, you know, I just read today that Ruth Sabbath, who was our original Warner in Cagney before he got like super crazy famous in Fiddler on the Roof, he just started uh, Broadway, BroadwayGoesViral.com, which is a group of every Broadway performer you can possibly think of singing from home, and it's to raise funds for Broadway Cares and the Actors Fund. So, uh, you know, you can uh, build relationships with those people, or maybe you want to be a person who starts one of your own because you have a specific take on theater and you love it and you want to manage a group. So that's a perfect way to step into leadership. And then when someone says to you, well, you want to be a producer, but what have you ever done that's shown initiative? You'd be like, well, let me show you. There's a lot of stuff that you can do that takes initiative, but that doesn't cost capital. Mm. Okay, we have time for one well, more. I, oh, I, you got I, things I, to say, kid, go. I think this is one to end on, actually. Um, it's okay. a very simple question. Where did you learn everything you know about producing? Um, well, hmm? we, we did, I mean, we in particular did everything, I think pretty much backwards from how normal people do it because yeah. we were, we were co-producers on Broadway shows and fundraisers. And then we took the true class, which is theatrical resources unlimited. And we took this CTI uh, commercial theater Institute class, the three day class, the 14 week. And I, you remember this Larry, cause I did the 14 week before you and uh, I'm sitting in class. I'm texting Larry like, Oh, suddenly so many things make sense oh, to me. We were supposed to do. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. So there, so this brings us to resources. The question that you're not letting me answer, which is great resources, Broadway briefing, daily email, free love if you want to actually take classes in producing that didn't used to exist but are now like full-on fabulous commercial theater institute cti have they have half day classes full day classes weekend classes on different elements of producing whoever asked my legal question there's a legal aspects of producing class and i think don't quote me, but I think you can get legal, if you're an attorney or about to be one, you can probably get legal credits for it as continuing education. Um, it was incredibly useful. It almost made me wish that I'd gone to law school. I will tell you there is a huge element of producing on the Broadway level is contractual and it is very helpful to read some books about that. Producing theater is probably the most seminal one. Mm. If you wanna learn how Broadway came to be and how the three main the three main original theater families, Schubert, Jujamson, and Niederlander all came together. Michael Riedel wrote a great book called Razzle Dazzle. And, and it, it, it reads like science fiction, mystery, crazy, um, conspiracy. It, there's everything in there and it is awesome. Other resources, Lars? What did I forget? I think you hit them all. I mean, you pretty much got the nail on that. I think um, 
Um, Ken Davenport also has great resources. Oh, yes, of course. Um, uh, the producer's perspective is his perspective. It's a great producer's perspective .com. and yeah. the, these are there are a lot of people who are eager to share and eager to create their team their tribe their partnership you know one of the things that Larry and I do when Broadway is turned on is um, we have a company called Broadway custom that brings in kids and teens from all over the world and does a week long super or sometimes two weeks long super intensive with them. So we give them acting, singing, dancing. We take them to Broadway shows. They go backstage, they go on stage, they meet the stars of the show. Then the next day, someone from the company comes in and teaches them the closing number or uh, we meet casting directors and agents. We do panels with the parents telling them how uh, casting directors will tell them how our parents can support their kid or how they can inadvertently sabotage their kid. We definitely do pizza parties and a final performance and all the things. But the reason I'm telling you this is because when Larry and I have sat in auditions, we have seen things happen that, oh, you, you just sank your own audition and we could have so easily turned that into a big win for you. So that was Broadway custom. And once Broadway's up and running again, you'll be able to hear more about it. Cause we, I think it's the class we created that we would have loved. We would have wanted kids. that class. Yeah, oh that man, would cool. I have wanted that class so badly. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing we'll say for those of you who are, who, who want to be in the room where it happens is take action now. Um, reach out. Who, what were some of our assignments? Lars, your chicken list. Yeah, your chicken. People, yeah, and, and people who you admire start to follow them at, at the very least on Instagram. They'd love to welcome your followingness and start to surround yourself with a conversation of I am a budding producer. I want to work in this industry. Who do you know? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Someone. That's how I've met my absolute favorite people. Thanks, Sue. What, are we done? I'm with you. We're, we're done. We're done. I mean, you know, I, but now, like, now we, 800 questions are coming. Know, right, I, so, you guys. Well, here's the thing. We can go on all night long, but we're going to look at these questions, right? And we're going to, we are going to have some more webinars coming up. Like I said, the 201s, the 301s, the grad school ones. So um, keep an eye on our um, Broadway custom page. You guys all please like it and follow it because it'll always be posted there. Cool, right. but can, can, we, can we do one more question? This is a really good question. Oh, and sure. it's even at 857. If you're part of a producing team, who determines which producer does what on the show? Yes, Barbara, great question. Um, your strengths will determine what you do on that show. So initially, we mentioned earlier that Larry and I, we love to fundraise for things that we believe in. We're both, as you can see, natural salespeople. We're very passionate and very vocal about what we love. So that was originally the only the only thing that we could officially bring to the table was like, here, we've raised a quarter of a million dollars. Do we get to sit at the table silently and listen when the people who have the creative experience make the decisions? And then we sat at enough tables and made enough relationships with the creatives that we realized we had ideas around that and things to say. And now that is our core strength. That's so crazy to say. Is that crazy to say, Larry? But that's a core that's strength. That's what happened, yeah, over time. So there are some, you know, and one of the other things that we really love to do is we love to bring groups to our shows and we do, we like to do group experiences for them. So we'll bring them, they'll come to dinner before the show and then we'll bring in a cast member or two to speak with them about the show. And then the group totally wigs out when an hour later, they're seeing that actor on stage in character. So we're also known as co-producers who will try our best to bring very large groups, very positive groups that will spread the word about the show. So Barbara, if any of that resonated with you, like, oh, that's me, oh, that sounds like me, then you start to know what kind of a producer you are. And then the things that you're like, ugh, I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna do any of the creative. I don't wanna bring groups. I don't wanna raise money. Find the people who really love doing that and partner with them. Great. Right on. No. I think we're done. You guys, this, <laughs> these questions are awesome. The ones that we didn't answer yet, we promise we will try our best to get to on the next webinar, which will be, we don't know when, because it's Corona. So we're just chasing our children around. In fact, kudos that we have not had a child interrupt us through this whole thing. Theater. I know this is kind of shocking that it's been <laughs> quiet and no surprises. So hey, uh, that's a huge victory. Um, um, thank you everybody for being with us tonight. Sue, do you have any final words for this gang? I am excited to meet our 
fellow budding producers. Those All right, go out and build relationships, y'all. It's still early in many parts of the country. Absolutely. Good night, everybody. Thanks so much. This will be this is going to be up. It's recorded. It's going to be up on our on our um, Broadway custom page. So you'll come find that. Yay. Thank you, everybody. Bye. All right. See ya.